earlier studies, this paper sometimes gets overlooked in 2002, but around 2002, 2003, uh, Georg Nagel and colleagues in Germany cloned the channel rhodopsin, uh, version one and version two, and um, that opened the possibility to use a fast optical tool in mammalian system to control processes. In very simplistic terms, these optical channels uh, that do not exist, this particular type of channels do not exist in ma mammalian systems, they take the energy of a photon and somehow translate it into energy of uh, ion fluxes and possibility to change membrane potentials and other things. And the kinetics is fast enough to make them relevant to the fields of neuroscience and uh, in the cardiac field. Um, so there's a number of papers that started um, appearing after this tool became available. Um, in my lab, we have been doing optical mapping with synthetic dyes, uh, as several of you uh, are doing in this institution and, and many other people, that is observing what happens in the heart um, with high spatial and temporal resolution. But in 2005, shortly after the Ed Boyden paper appeared in Nature Neuroscience, I had a very bright MD-PhD student who uh, came to me and said, I think we can um, consider adapting this tool. And we started talking, and it was natural enough. Excitable cells, it doesn't matter, brain, heart, uh, skeletal muscle or beta cells for insulin release for that matter. So we started trying um, early on and the first tools didn't quite work. So it took a while to, to actually get this working. So the concept here is we have the tools that we have been using for optical sensing and imaging um, that provide very high spatial and temporal resolution. Adapting this new optogenetic actuators uh, type of tools, we aim to match the spatial and temporal resolution of the observation with ability to perturb the system very precisely. And add to that the ability to genetically encode, so only specific cells to be uh, manipulated uh, in this process. So again, that opens the possibility to uh, sort of build a controller and a feedback loop where we can perturb the patterns of activation by light. Not only observe, but also perturb. And that's our vision for all optical cardiac electrophysiology. The high throughputness or the massively parallel nature comes from the fact that with light, we can perturb many things simultaneously unlike any other technology that I know of. So there are many applications of uh, this, and different groups work on, on different aspects of this. Uh, some of them mentioned here, we, we do some in this um, uh, fields. But today, I only have time to cover appropriately two areas. And I will start with this one, which is a little bit more in the science fiction domain um, and with potential to, um, to provide mechanistic insights how um, arrhythmias happen, how can we control them, not immediate vision, how can we translate this into the clinic. Well, the second application I will be talking about is more um, uh, imme immediately translatable. So, we came up with this concept of wave steering, uh, which I will try to explain. So there is recognition that cardiac arrhythmias are space-time events. They, they're complex and space and time are linked. And the current strategies, electrical strategies, to affect cardiac activity, you can have um, localized pacing or perturbation here single pacing. Uh, in resynchronization therapy, there are several sites of pacing. It can be distributed. And then in defibrillation, depending how you apply the defibrillation shock, it could be a global type of application 
of, of the perturbation. All of this can be implemented by electrical means or optical means. Once you optogenetically transform the heart, you can indeed pace from a location, from multiple locations, or apply globally light. Uh, in ablation, things you want to um, kill or ablate tissue at particular locations where you believe it's affected. So in all these cases, we think in terms of static pattern, the electrodes uh, at XY location. And that's how computer modelers think, OK, let's stimulate from this location or that location. An example of using optogenetic tools to implement complex patterns is given here. Imagine that you can put the electrodes not in, in um, two or three locations, but you can project any pattern you want. This here is uh, the so-called Siemens star. In optics, it's used to, to uncover spatial resolution. So you, you draw circles, and the closer you go to the center, uh, the higher the frequency of the pattern, and you're looking how contrast changes. So in this case, this checkerboard pattern, we have ongoing arrhythmia here. The color encodes activity. So this uh, um, disjoint wavelets. Black is the wavefront. Many, many wavelets. Fibrillatory-like activity in a dish. And we're asking the question, if I impose this checkerboard pattern where only the white squares, I, I will depolarize, but the rest won't be affected. Can I clamp the system? So. Effectively, we want to do a defibrillation clamp and see whether activity can continue on outside of this. And then you can model this in, in, in a real experiment and try to ask the question, how big the squares, uh, how big of squares would do the best job? Uh, what kind of frequency of the spatial pattern would I want to uh, terminate this arrhythmia? So within the squares, during the applied shock, we terminate activity, but because of the spatial um, um, scale of this ongoing activity, it, it's a very small space constant, activity continues in the non clamp uh, regions uh, in this example. So it's a new, it's more powerful than electrical stimulation in the sense that I can change the spatial patterns. There are still static patterns in this case. So it's illustrating a point related to the fact that we can do different patterns. Now imagine going beyond the static pattern. The key thing that can be brought about with this optogenetic actuation techniques is something we call dynamically reconfigurable. In other words, we can think of the stimulation in terms of a movie rather than electrodes at XY location. And I, I typically give the example of uh, if you want to project Casablanca on the tissue and want the tissue to respond, you can do that. Um, so you have to think of the stimulation in terms of a movie. It's a different concept. Um, yes? So the examples that I, I was showing, yes, this was a simple thing where we can control everything, a monolayer of cells. Yes. There is limited motion in a 2D. Um, it, it's not affecting the things we measure. Yes, in vivo, different story. Uh, right. So instead of targeting the activity of individual cells, as you would with optogenetic actuation to, to stimulate activity only in these cells or to suppress activity. We use also hyperpolarizing opsins to suppress activity. If you think of controlling the emergent phenomena, the wave, it's, it's a slightly different concept. So we are aiming to, to observe and control what the cells are doing. There are, uh, there are waves of activation rather than focusing on individual cells and trying to generate action potentials or change the shape of the action potentials in these uh, individual cells. 
So our target are the waves. And the wave steering comes from the fact that we want to change the properties of the waves. We want to either accelerate, slow down the waves, or make them turn around, rather than, again, targeting um, individual cells. So for, for this work, yes, the sample was uh, uh, two-dimensional. This is work with uh, Dr. Gil Bott, um, who was at Oxford at the time. Uh, Gil moved now to uh, Canada, to McGill, and we continue to work together. So in order to do this, the, the setup was as follows. Um, we have a two-dimensional preparation. And in this particular case, we were imaging with the dye-free technique. So oblique angle illumination that um, allowed us to track the waves by interferometric mechanism that I won't go into um, with this camera. Uh, no dice in the system. And then this is the digital micro-mirror device. Uh, very much like the chip that is in this projector um, that allowed us to project computer-generated patterns onto the tissue after we have registered what the patterns are, the, the endogenous patterns that we are seeing, spiral wave or whatever. Then we decide what to project. It's not quite real-time feedback but it's quasi-real-time because we observe and then we decide what to project here. Um, so this device, the digital micro-mirror device, coupled with this prism, allows us to project that movie that I was talking about or static patterns or whatever. Um, we use blue light in this case because we work with channel redoption 470 nanometers excitation. Using this system, we are able to uh, modulate the conduction velocity of the waves to speed them up or slow them down. Um, this is based on our understanding how channel rhodopsin works in the cardiomyocytes. We have done some simulations. We have developed a mathematical model how the channel rhodopsin in, uh, works in the myocytes. And we can modulate the conduction velocity not necessarily by changing gap junctions or spaces that many of you uh, here study, but uh, mostly by playing the, uh, with the availability of the sodium channels, depolarizing, uh, hyperpolarizing at the right spot. Um, so you can alter the properties of the waves, conduction velocity. Uh, you can do that in a space-constrained manner. We can alter the direction of the waves by applying a particular sequence of perturbations, we can completely block the wave in one direction, but allow it to propagate in the other direction. And perhaps the striking example to illustrate the wave steering approach was um, changing the direction of a spiral wave. So you have a wave rotating in a particular direction, dynamically spinning the wave the other way. Um, and this is a movie that, um, uh, oops, let's see if the movie will play my pointer. Okay. So the recording is a die free recording of spiral wave activity. And when you see the brighter thing coming in, is a computer generated pattern that is applied for only one rotation of the wave and then let go. So a wave that was naturally turning in, in a particular direction, going clockwise here, we turn to make it go counterclockwise and then back and forth. And this is a repeated type of activation maps from, from different um, uh, points in, in a movie um, to, to show that we can spin the wave the way we want. Clinically, why would you want to do that? You don't. Um, it, it doesn't really make sense to, to have an arrhythmia and make it spin back and forth. Uh, but it illustrates the power that if you can do that, certainly we can take the wave and push it out to a border and kill it. So that is easier to do than spin the wave back and forth. 
Um, I can play this once again. So the observation that we make in real time is the frequency of rotation of the wave and roughly the, the spatial properties of the wave in order to decide what kind of a wave pattern we are going to apply to stimulate this tissue, um, the, the light pattern that is superimposed. The overall vision with these tools, with the wave steering, is the following. We, in vitro, in these monolayers or in a piece of tissue, one can design a powerful biological simulator that hasn't been available before. Yeah, that's an interesting point if you uh, notice. So this map looks almost identical to this and almost identical to this. But when you rotate in the other direction, the actual point of singularity is physically a slightly different location. There is inherent asymmetry because of the slight biological heterogeneity there. Um, so you have a shift in the singularity point that is true for counterclockwise uh, and is different from the clockwise rotation. So you can probe heterogeneities in the system and see asymmetries of the waves uh, or whatever else you might want to do. Um, so the, the power of this technique um, is in being able to generate a biological computer, so to speak. Um, none of the computational people currently have implemented a dynamic stimulator. It's, in my mind, easy enough to do, um, but it just doesn't exist in the computational world. Here, you can run different scenarios in the same system, um, which you have all the biological variables. It might be a limited system because it's a monolayer or it's an in vitro prep, but it's way better than a computer model which has a lot of assumptions in it. So th that's the power that we see in, in this particular um, type of application. Can you take this concept to the clinic and control activity in the whole heart? So th there was a question, what is our... Um, trying to... It seemed to have frozen. Oops, it goes. Um, so in order to test things out in, uh, in a three-dimensional system, uh, we are developing techniques to uh, make rat hearts light sensitive and to hopefully do this in a selective manner without affecting other organs. Um, so playing with different viruses to deliver this in minimally invasive manner um, uh, to the heart and have the animal survive. So we have um, transmural expression of the optogenetic tools and we can apply them in open chest type of uh, situation and the activation penetrates deep enough to affect the activity of the heart. We don't have optical maps of this open chest um, situation. We do have optical maps on a Langendorf. So taking the heart out and playing out some of the projection uh, techniques. Um, this is relatively recent work, so I'm not going to show anything on Langendorf heart but this is the direction we, we go. Um, the rat heart, the thickness is beyond the, the penetration depth of the blue light that we are using. So there is a limitation how much of the, the tissue you, you affect in depth. We, we have certain strategies and have been trying things to shift things to the red. There are um, options that mutant toxins that operate more in the red domain, but they also have sensitivity in, in the blue range. So they're um, typically with slower kinetic parameters than the standard channel rhodopsin.
So it's a work in progress how to make this more uh, relevant and to penetrate deeper uh, in, this, in this tissue. Um, but my message from this part of the talk is that it's a new way of biological simulation within the tissue with light, uh, without touch. Yes? Right. So in this hearts, um, it was pretty much every myocyte was expressing. The expression level is very high. Um, the in vitro system, we have very high expression, definitely above 95%. Uh, we have done some computer simulations where we asked that same question. What should be the pattern of expression and what percentage? And uh, colleagues of mine in Germany, Philip Sasse's group, they have probed this kind of question experimentally, which matches pretty much with our computational predictions. And the percentage to be able to achieve um, defibrillation type of thing, you have to be above 45% or so by applying some global means. So th there is some threshold where, yes, the the cells have to express. It doesn't have to be even the majority of the cells. And the pattern of expression does matter. So the second application that I'm going to uh, talk about is probably less exciting um, in terms of the engineering of it, but uh, instantly translational uh, because um, because of this work, we, we actually were approached by a number of companies that uh, this technology probably will get uh, adapted for um, drug discovery, cardiotoxicity type of testing. So the question is, can we do many, many samples where we change the conditions and measure things in completely automated uh, fashion? And what should the experimental system be? Um, I'm not married to this technology. It doesn't have to be uh, stem cell derived cardiomyocytes, um, but um, it's the best system we have to, to model human things that is scalable. That is, we can do many, many samples with it. So that is the system we currently use. So this is work that um, Alex Klimas uh, in my lab um, developed mostly. And um, the idea is that non-contact, we can stimulate at whatever pattern we, we decide. And we can record optically, again, in a non-contact manner, voltage, calcium, contractility in these cells. And the whole thing can be completely automated. So no human interaction. We can go through different systems, different wells, and, and so on. So the, the current configuration schematically looks something like this. We have a single detector, one camera, and a bunch of light sources for actuation, the blue one. And in this case, uh, the green and the red could be two different uh, probes. Right now, this one we use for calcium, this one for voltage. More recently, we are recording mitochondrial calcium and something else, so, or NADH or something else. Anything optical, any parameter that you can imagine can be combined in this and can be combined with stimulating the cells at different uh, types of frequencies. So the, the plates we use are standard plates that can be 96 well plates, 384, whatever uh, industrial uh, standards there are. And uh, the process is automated in the sense that the system goes to a location, XY location, out of focuses, um, does the stimulation that we have prescribed, records, moves to another location, does the same. It's a multi serial recording, so we simultaneously uh, query about uh, two to 300 cells in this case. And then we go well by well. Um, uh, to, to collect all the data. Spectrally, you have to accommodate all the different things that you are measuring and using. 
And this is an example from iPS-derived cardiomyocytes with um, uh, stimulated optogenetically and recording voltage and calcium from these cells. With this system, without even implementing the, um, the global view of capturing all the waves or wells at the same time, um, we can do a plate, 96 well plate, for about 10 minutes with, with no user interaction, just hit a button and it collects the data and uh, sorts out the data. So when you do the calculation, we, we can essentially meet what the industry means under uh, high throughput screening, which the, the colloquial um, use of the, the word high throughput screening, many people claim they do, um, but industry means 10,000 assays or compounds a day. Maybe assays is more uh, correct here. Um, when I said 10,000 compounds a day at the conference recently, and there were some pharma people there, they're like, you have no clue. Um, we, we only, so Merck uh, generates only five to 10 compounds a week. Why do we need 10,000 compounds a day? And then I had to explain myself that it's 10,000 assays a day. So when we talk about proper experimental design, Historically, when Fisher, um, the statistics guy, uh, described what a proper experimental design is, the factorial experimental design is part of it. All of us doing biology, we just financially cannot afford, um, and logistically, we don't have the manpower to properly do experimental design. None of our studies do factorial experimental design, taking into account all the different variables. To have controls and perturbations to account for sex differences, hormonal differences, concentrations of ions that you guys are interested in, um, different disease concentrations of ions, different disease conditions, mutations. If you start multiplying this very easily, even if you consider five or 10 per case here, you go into the 10,000s or 100,000s of, of samples that you have to do. It's just not manageable. So the high throughputness is a necessity if you want the answers for all of these variables to be taken into account. To be able to do female and male cells, which we recently do, to be able to add estrogen and testosterone, and, and they do change things. Um, certainly the concentrations change things. Uh, cardiomyopathy or normal change things. So the, the power of high throughput is to be able to go through all of this um, and provide answers, even if only five or 10 drugs per week come from a major um, uh, pharmaceutical company. Um, this slide sort of illustrates how currently cardiotoxicity is done and um, sort of Alex prepared this slide. Um, so there is drug discovery going on and then the cardiotoxicity is done um, in heterologous assays, you, you have hex cells with the potassium HERC channel because that's the main target um, believed for cardiotoxicity. And you do the screen. You ask the question whether this new compound is um, blocking the HERC channel or not. Then from there, you have to go to in vivo studies, and this were, I guess, Alex selected them to be particularly cute to get the uh, ethics message uh, home. And then we learned, I didn't know this, that the very first introduction into humans is always in healthy young males, never females, um, uh, because you don't know the long-term genotoxic effects of a compound, so females are not used in this very first um, introduction in humans. It's a problem for cancer drugs because you can't introduce chemotherapeutic drugs um, into healthy young males. So it's problematic how do you switch to humans before you go into the proper phase one, two, three clinical trials. So the, um, the push in the last three or four years has been to come up with a better metrics and pro possibly change the, how drugs um, cardiotoxicity is being tested. 
illustrated here is the concept that um, the, the QT prolongation, which is a signature for cardio potential cardiotoxicity because it can lead to certain arrhythmias, such as TORSAT, um, it's linked to prolongation at the action potential level, which, yes, in the majority of the cases is due to blocking the, the potassium um, delayed rectifier, the ERK channel, but there are drugs that um, do not pose such a risk, even though they do block the, the ERK channel, such as verapamil, amiodarone, and so on. So the so-called SIPO initiative, Comprehensive In Vitro Proarrhythmia Assay, is uh, an initiative organized by the FDA and a number of international organizations with the idea to move this to multi-ion channel testing instead of just ERK. And their vision was, we'll increase the number of patch clump tests, use computational modeling to integrate this data and predict action potential prolongation or arrhythmia effects, and that will be the assay. But in view of the emerging stem cell-derived myocytes, we also will explore the possibility to directly go in this human patient-derived myocytes um, to, s to see if a drug is proarrhythmic or not. And then the, the last part of this SIPO initiative has to do with uh, better analysis on the ECG level. So we um, joined this SIPO initiative and signed up uh, to test our technology in, uh, in the context of drug testing. So the vision is the following. Replace those middle points with the cute puppies and uh, the first in human with something that is human but is purely in vitro. So it is a patient-derived stem cells, stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes that are scalable, that we can grow in many, many wells and small samples to do the testing and apply a system like ours, some sort of a system that is high throughput, um, to, to be able to do this testing before going into clinical trials. Again, the power of the throughput gives you a view of many, many biological variables, um, even if, if the cells themselves are imperfect model of the real thing. So the, the knowledge of the many variables gives you a power of prediction, in our opinion. So we signed to do a blind testing. Um, and it was one woman operation. Alex did um, everything without um, actual automated dispense system and stuff like that. So we did our tests in 384 well format with the so-called optodized system that we have um, designed. And she did uh, 420 multicellular samples over um, less than 24 hours of work time. Um, again, without automation. So we did pacing and spontaneous activity um, and organized the data. And our goal was to ask the question whether pacing matters. Um, uh, whether we can do this with this system and um, properly guess. Again, we were blind to the 12 compounds. We had to dilute them according to instructions and, and do all of this. Um, a little side note, the cost of such an assay. In the field, there are uh, many people that are interested in tissue engineering, and the claim is we have to make the cells more mature. They have to be in 3D. They have to be in certain configurations to be more appropriate. If you are to do engineered heart tissues, um, the style that uh, Zimmermann's group in Germany and many others, they are not very big, but they use a lot of cells. So for 10,000 assays, the cost just in cells would be about $2 million. Um, not, not adaptable for uh, industry, not financially uh, feasible. If you do uh, 3D bundles, there are several groups that have scaled things down to micro bundles um, with the cells. It's still pretty expensive. 
if you keep scaling the samples down, multicellular samples, but smaller and smaller, so let's say 384, that the assay that we did, is about two orders of magnitude cheaper and becomes more and more feasible to actually run this kind of assays. So our goal is to find the smallest still relevant system. Single cell is not relevant uh, from our point of view. So what is the smallest cluster that still will provide meaningful answers? Um, so this is what we did. Um, and after we acquired the data, we submitted our results to um, the organizers. And then they revealed the key. The 12 compounds that were sent to us are shown here. The red ones are labeled by the SIPO initiative as high-risk proarrhythmic compounds. The yellow ones are intermediate risk. And the green ones are considered safe. This particular organization is um, according to a slightly different classification by Redfern, very, very uh, powerful, impactful paper in 2003. So the order is slightly different, but generally similar. So how did we do compared to what is known for these compounds? This is an example of records, um, optically paced uh, voltages in black and calcium in red. These are actually unfiltered data. Um, so the, the signal is high quality signal. And I'm showing from all the cells, um, which is to 300 cells, but we can record from single cells without a problem. And this is ebutylite, a highly proarrhythmic compound that generates this kind of EADs. At concentration, 100 nanomolar is actually a clinically uh, relevant concentration used in the clinic. It's an enhancer of the late sodium channel, this particular drug. So there are a couple of ideas. What do you look for when you try to quantify proarrhythmic effects? The simplest one is action potential prolongation, but there are some concepts that never quite took off, this is from an Vartis symposium in 2005, to look at the shape of the action potential and uh, so-called triangulation. How does the shape change when you apply a drug? And that seems to be informative. And in addition to the shape um, and prolongation of the action potential, to look at dispersion, spatial or temporal dispersion, uh, some sort of um, statistics on the action potentials. So having our data, we are able to look at all of those uh, parameters. Examples here are just action potential prolongation. And this, uh, un, uh, these are blind plates that we recorded. So the black bar is control. The gray one is a very low dose of positive, so proarrhythmic drug at very low concentration. And then there are the, the concentrations that we were supposed to apply. Based on this, I would say this and this drug look like proarrhythmic because they prolong the action potential. This one um, actually seems to shorten the action potential a bit. The identity of these drugs is as follows. So this was the fetolite, highly proarrhythmic drug, cisapride, high on the intermediate, but uh, quite proarrhythmic, and metoprolol is a, um, a safe drug. Looking at many parameters with our system and the ranking of the drugs, we quickly, if I draw your attention to the paste case of action potential prolongation or, or triangulation, it's pretty reliably saying yes, no, whether the drugs are safe, the green ones, the, the assay comes negative in both cases. And then if I binarize everything, there is something, something positive on these drugs. And then you can go through different metrics. We have many samples. Uh, we have many cases that we can look at different parameters. Um, I'll skip the high throughput quality assay. So speaking in terms of sensitivity and specificity, if we just take the, the binarized metrics, 
our assay comes out to be 100% specific when we consider action potential prolongation. Um, that is, it, it never says if a drug is non-proarrhythmic, it never thinks that it might be proarrhythmic. The sensitivity is about 88.9%. Similar numbers for triangulation as a uh, parameter, a predictive parameter. Um, the, the criticism of these cells being immature and so on uh, has to be viewed in the context of the practicality and the actual numbers, uh, how an assay does. It was somewhat um, striking to see that in vivo assays of cardiotoxicity, let's say a dog in vivo assay, the sensitivity and specificity are numbers like this. So again, we took the IPS-derived cardiomyocytes, which are approximation of what is in vivo, much cheaper system, many more controls, many more variables to, um, to consider. It does better than this. Um, it certainly does better than the recombinant ERK assays that are currently being used for cardiotoxicity testing. So depending on the question that you are asking, uh, it's worth considering the IPS-derived cardiomyocytes even in their current form, which might be imperfect. Um, beyond the, the binary effects, we were interested to uh, sort of quantify the, um, the risk of these drugs, taking into account the effective therapeutic dose of the drugs, um, so the, the effective therapeutic plasma concentration. And uh, this too come out very pro-arrhythmic. Uh, Bepridil here is misqualified, which uh, which was the reason for the 88.9% sensitivity. Um, in general, the green drugs uh, on, the right, uh, on the left side of the risk prediction, meaning they're not increasing risk. Um, this is the metrics that we derived based on uh, APD90 prolongation. Uh, the paste definitely performs better than spontaneous activity. Similarly, PACE performs better than spontaneous activity when we take into account triangulation. Um, good predic prediction. So from this blind study that we did for SIPA, um, the insights were that pacing generally reduced the number of um, drug-triggered events and improved predictive power. The power of multiple controls, we had controls on each and every plate. I have never designed experiments with so many controls, but it paid off. You have to have always the, the controls right next to the, the other samples, and we can afford to do that in this high throughput format. Um, we run at room temperature and then at 37, and it didn't seem to matter for the prediction of cardiotoxicity in this case. Many things change with temperature effects, but not the, the actual uh, risk for this particular drugs, which was interesting. Um, and um, in general, we learned a lot how to design this, this type of high throughput experiments. Then we, we looked at the literature at more controversial things. Vanoxirin is a drug that very recently failed in, in phase three clinical trials. It was supposed to be this um, uh, poster child for the SIPO initiative, which was inspired by the idea to bring more drugs to market, because the belief was the, this ERK assays are preventing drugs from reaching market because they are too restrictive. Any compound that blocks ERK is put on the shelf. So venoxerin is potent ERK channel blocker, but also blocks a number of other things. It was considered um, early on in the 1980s for Parkinson's, for other things, and they decided it's, it's, too, big, uh, it's too strong of an ERK channel blocker, so we won't pursue it. Um, Buzz Brown and other um, cardiologists decided, let's revive venoxerin. And they went through all the preclinical testing and human testing, and phase three, 
And then it was a premature termination of this trial because it puts, uh, it put patients at risk, actually did cause TDPs. So we asked the question, if we had our system, could, could we have predicted this before it ever went to, into dogs or patients or whatever? So um, by any metrics that we looked, we, we took this vanoxarin compound. It was pro-arrhythmic on any metrics that we could see. And we tested this in iPS-derived human cardiomyocytes. It's hard to, to understand why this was not seen in the preclinical trials and in phase one and phase two. We started looking at the design of the trials and that you can slightly bias things by assigning different numbers of female male patients and, and so on. So it was reassuring to understand that um, our system actually can, uh, for some reason, some things are not showing properly, can uh, have the power, uh, even though in a retrospective study, to, to capture uh, drugs like that and uh, prevent waste of money and in the endangering patients. Um, we can provide spatial information how different cells respond. This is calcium respond, uh, response from single cells. Um, some of the cells can be going completely different frequency than the overall global signal here that shows some alternance, but this cell is going at much higher frequency. And we are looking at the spatial signatures as predictors of, um, of cardiotoxicity. And indeed, even in this picture of the spatial coherence, uh, if you will, vanoxerine um, behaves very similar to dufetolide. So it's hard to miss the, the, um, the, the uh, pro-arrhythmic nature of it. Um, what can you do with this type of high throughput screening other than drug testing? You can try to model different disease models. Um, we have a collaboration on a very rare disease, which I was talking to uh, one of your colleagues, and he has kind of a special rare disease. Ours is a, a protein um, that is responsible for N-terminal acetylation um, defect that was discovered by my collaborator, um, uh, goes online at Cold Spring Harbor. And the, the phenotype is that uh, the, the babies uh, do display uh, some polymorphic uh, arrhythmias. So we derived cells uh, from these babies and, um, and did some testing using our high throughput system. And the phenotype was very subtle in vitro where we had to use different pacing rates to uncover differences between the patient and control cells. So this is the restitution curve, how the action potential duration changes as a function of, uh, of the basic cycle length or the frequency. And only at slow rates, we could see the, the prolongation in the patient cells. And we are trying to uncover which proteins were hit down the line because this enzyme mutation is very, um, it's in, engaged in the acetylation of many proteins. So it's, it's not an ion channel mutation, a uh, classic one. Um, in, in addition to looking at single cells or multicellular effects of drugs, one can envision adapting this kind of assay for cell coupling. Um, this is work that we are trying to publish at the, at the moment. If you have cell type one, that can be stimulated by light and cell type 2, from which you can optically stimulate. Um, computationally, we can show that you can estimate the, the level of coupling between these cells uh, in a two-cell assay or in a multicellular system. And you can get a readout that is analogous to if you do this gap frap technique that we have done in a multicellular preparation to assess the level of functional coupling between cells, or even analogous to a dual patch clamp, which is much more uh, involved and non-scalable technique. So we're looking how to bring scalable tools to assessment of coupling. And this was done with fibroblasts in green, 
and the red cells are cardiomyocytes asking the question how coupled are the, the fibroblasts to the myocytes. And we try to modulate the coupling with several agents uh, to generate low, intermediate, and high coupling and try to see the readouts, which in our case, uh, how much light do I need in order to get the impulse from one cell type to the other. And under low coupling conditions, uh, we need a lot of light. And at the high coupling conditions, we need much less light at all pulse duration, uh, durations. So um, I'm going fast through this, but uh, we are trying to, to um, design this assay to substitute the dual patch clump type of testing and be able to inform us about coupling conditions. There are some engineering tools that we try to do this on a dual cell type of um, approach. So we are machining, uh, we are uh, microfabricating these little chambers where we can flow cell type one in green, cell type two in red, and let them couple in these chambers. And then by light, probing the different, the thousands of little cell pairs in order to, um, so this is a microfluidic chip um, to use the assay in cell pair format. Um, it can be done in multicellular format without having to position the, the cell pairs, but um, this is um, high precision assay. It could be neuron to myocyte, it could be fibroblast to myocyte, or pericyte uh, to fibroblast, whatever your favorite type of cells is. So I kind of rushed through this part of the presentation um, because I'm looking at the time. Um, the things that one can do um, to, to summarize, the powerful biological simulator was the first part of the talk um, where you can use patterned light, dynamic patterned light to navigate waves in cardiac tissue, the wave steering idea, and play out different scenarios that might inform uh, strategies for going in vivo. We don't envision the optogenetic techniques to be literally taken into the clinic, but they can inform decisions how to implement with tools that can be used in the clinic. Um, this is very real, that it can be used as a scalable and easily automatable assay for cardiotoxicity testing and disease modeling. And I do believe this is the, the true translational potential of this technology. Um, I haven't shown uh, much of this, but we certainly work on computational aspects and how to make how to improve experimental models. We have collaboration with um, uh, computer science at Oxford, and we are feeding them particular data to help improve the computational models in our field. Um, and this uh, is uh, linked to this, uh, that, that uh, we, we need better predictive power models, and we can probably tailor those to the particular cells derived from a patient, so the, to tailor them to personalized medicine, something that you cannot do with animal models or um, tissue extracted from human hearts because it's hard to take a sample from a live human being without endangering them. So um, the path towards personalized medicine in our field, I really see, has to come through a technology similar to the iPS-derived cardiomyocytes, where it comes uh, by non-invasive collection from a human, and then we improve the means uh, to mature the cells to make them more uh, relevant. So uh, we believe that high-throughput, all-optical uh, uh, cardiac electrophysiology can help in both of this. Um, and the people that... Um, contributed to this work, uh, people currently or previously in my lab, um, uh, and some collaborators, particularly uh, Gil at McGill, um, at Hopkins, uh, Natalia, and Pat Boyle, and this uh, Ira Cohen from Stony Brook is my collaborator, certainly Matt Kay at um, GW, 
Cold Spring Harbor, Harbor uh, goes online and his former student, um, Yang. And we have done some collaboration with Greg Morley at uh, NYU. So our work is currently funded by uh, NIH, these two institutes, and um, several grants through the biophotonics program at NSF. Thank you. which requires you to extend space and, and have sizable piece of sample in order to measure conduction velocity from point to point. The smaller that piece becomes, the more challenging the experimental measurement becomes. You have to run at insane speed to resolve how the pulse uh, propagated. So instead of measuring conduction velocity, we are leaning towards this kind of spatial maps of synchronicity, uh, if you will. So we are applying the light homogeneously to all the cells, and we are trying to uncover the difference in their response as a surrogate measure of the way they talk to each other. Uh, it, of course, uncovers also their inherent ion channel makeup uh, a little bit, but we think that <coughs> the spatial coherence profile capturing the, the way they communicate, the strength of communication, and if a drug is disturbing the strength of communication between these cells. And then we are, we are hoping that by these spatial maps, we can use them as an independent predictor in addition to action potential changes and, and things like that. So that's the idea, to be able to do this coupling in a very small sample to, to remain scalable. Well, it might be if you scale up in terms of larger and larger strips of tissue, that there could be various unmediarities and things that would not necessarily emerge from this single cell coupling or the single cell ion channel. That's, That's right. true. Uh, yes. The, the spatially extended tissue, you can start having long range type of uh, effects which are very hard to do in a scalable system. I said, uh, as I said, the you have to extend, and that, by necessity, restricts you how many samples you can do. So that could be a follow-up assay if you believe that it's doing something in the uh, synchronization of the cells. You might want to look at uh, larger scale effects, which, of course, are important. Um, so we have loaded cells. It, 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 that project has been in the works for uh, several years, but then I moved, and um, it, it's tough to, to make those chambers and reliably load cells. So we have loaded one cell type so far. We have not done measurements from cell pairs yet. Right. So when we published our first paper in 2011, um, I literally was getting phone calls from patients asking when will optical pacemakers be on the market. And uh, it, 
it was never my idea that we will put this into patients at the time. Now, is this translatable? There is an ongoing uh, clinical trial for uh, retinitis pigmentosa, which they put channel rhodopsin in humans. Uh, it started last year in August. I haven't seen the outcomes, but I haven't heard that it's terminated, so it must be safe <laughs> so far. Uh, so it's not inconceivable to uh, do a transgenic human to be able to make them respond to light. In the eye, it's a little bit more natural to use these tools. Uh, in the heart, um, in our first paper, I, I sort of made the calculations, what would it take to, for this to be a disruptive technology? Because pacemakers are a success story. The threshold is very high for taking over. So an electronic pacemaker works reliably, very few issues why would I want to be genetically modified to go to optical? Um, it, it could become beneficial if we can show uh, orders of magnitude improvement in energy um, needs so that there is never a need for replacing a battery. Um, if uh, in defibrillation, if it can be done to be painless um, because Currently, it, it, it kind of, uh, the contracture of the skeletal muscle and nerves and, and stuff make it painful. So there are a couple of scenarios where this might become a technology to put in a human being, but I guess I'm more conservative in, in thinking why would we do that if, if there is a successful technology at the moment. It's very hard, a high threshold for Yes, <laughs> that, that would be. Yeah. Oh, uh, we have done it with uh, rat cells, with anything. We are not married to the IPS derived myocytes. Uh, um, yes, we have put fibroblasts, we haven't systematically studied, so I don't have data on how percentage fibroblasts uh, affects uh, the, the output. Uh, in fact, we, we have uh, transformed human heart slices, uh, so we have a project, joint project with Igor Efimov. Um, it, it's the viability of the slices that has been the bottleneck, really. Um, to make them useful in our system. But anything, tissue, cells, it, it's kind of, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. Or so um, we have only partially explored uh, fluctuations over time, um, simply because for the uh, SIPA study we wanted to limit uh, according to the rules whatever they wanted us to measure in terms of duration. But I'm interested in the longer term dynamics of oscillations of the action potential. And only last month, we started actually measuring mitochondrial calcium with uh, an optogenetic probe. Um, so uh, we have the ability to measure the voltage together with the mitochondrial calcium that probably will give more insights who is driving whom and whether they're correlated in this cell in particular. Yeah, I have asked Matt, should we switch uh, the, the fuels or whatever? And uh, it's kind of 
that experiment, yes, we have to employ the, the high throughputness and alter many, many things in, in the hundreds of wells uh, in order to start uncovering patterns because it's not trivial to start changing solutions. And uh, so we, we haven't played with that yet. Thank you.